everyone. Welcome to everyone. Now, my story probably started a little bit differently to what you might imagine. As an eight-year-old, when I first started sailing, I was actually terrified of the water. I didn't like sailing. It was cold, it was wet, it was miserable. I was probably the last person you would expect to go on to sail around the world. I was a quiet, shy, timid kid, not the sort of person you'd expect to do something like this. But my family were doing it. My older sister loved sailing. We'd be down at the yacht club every weekend, and I suppose I came to enjoy it, and a little bit later again, I did come to love it. I was also terribly dyslexic as a kid. Couldn't spell, couldn't read at the time, to save my life. Still can't spell to save my life. So mum used to read to me all the time. She'd be constantly be reading to me, trying to encourage and, I suppose, inspire me. I don't think she quite realised what she was going to do because she'd be constantly reading me stories about adventurers and sailors. And one of these books was by Jesse Martin, a young Victorian guy who sailed around the world aged 18. And this story sort of struck me because, yes, it was just another amazing adventure, but I realised in his story that he was just an ordinary guy. He was the guy who could have lived next door and he'd done this amazing thing. And that just started me thinking, well, if he's done this, what is it that I can do? But, of course, it's a big idea, and it does take a long time to get your head around it. Without realising it, I spent that time from when I was 11 and I first read that book to the next couple of years visualising, without realising what I was doing, um, you know, putting myself in the situations that I might find myself if I went on to sail around the world. So, you know, picture yourself. Can you imagine yourself completely in the middle of the ocean, water for miles and miles in every direction? What about a huge, big wall of water, waves towering down on you? Can you imagine being, doing that? Would you want to do that? These were the questions that I was asking myself. I came to the conclusion that I did and that I could do this. Uh, at age 13, I told, I probably should have asked my parents that I was going to sail around the world. Um, and as you can imagine, I don't know that they entirely took me seriously because it's a big thing to say you're going to do. And when a kid comes up and says they're going to do something like this, I'm not sure you totally believe them to start with. So I had to set about proving to them that I was going to do this. And I did that through first gating experience and then showing them that I could. And I was also going to do it in the safest possible way. So the experience I started gaining was through all sorts of different kinds of sailing across the Tasman, down to the Southern Arctic, up and down the east coast of Australia. And this was fantastic because not only was I gaining that experience, but I was also meeting lots of fantastic old sailors along the way. These old salty sea dogs who had years of experience behind me, them and had so much to teach me as well. I learnt that, I gained that experience, but I also had to learn other things. And that was you know, celestial navigation, navigating by the stars, uh, I had to learn um, fixing engines, stitching up sails, all sorts of skills that you need that aren't quite sailing. You know, I had to learn about the nutrition that I was going to need for a voyage like this. I had to learn first aid because I was going to be completely self-reliant out there. I remember sitting in my first aid course learning CPR going, great, I'm a solo sailor, this is going to be really useful. <laughs> so all of these skills uh, and, of course, another critical element to the preparation was funding. I was working as a dishy in a local restaurant, and I worked out that it was going to take me till I was 40 years old to be able to afford to sail around the world. Clearly, that was not going to break any age records. So finding some supporters and some sponsors was really important. And that started out quite interestingly. If you can imagine a 14, 15-year-old girl literally getting up on the phone, calling up the marketing director of big companies, asking for their support. I kind of understand where they were coming from by not supporting me. But eventually, I did get some great support. And that happened first through some smaller local companies, you know, donating some sales, maybe some chocolate bars, and it built up to bigger supporters. Also, very importantly, I had somebody give me a boat, buy me a boat to use for the voyage. This was one of the adventurers that I'd met, Don McIntyre, who'd done heaps of sailing himself, and he wanted to support me by buying me this boat. An incredible gesture of support. But the boat was the start of a lot more work. Now, I always talk about the preparation a lot, and it's so important. The adventure is the exciting part, but it only happens because of that preparation. It really is 90% about the preparation, 10% about the voyage itself. So this boat had to be stripped down, strengthened up, and completely new equipment put on board. A lot of work had to go into it. Every tiny little detail on that boat had to be perfect. 
Uh, it might be a strange thing to talk about in relation to an adventure, but risk management was really important. Every situation had to be thought through and solutions had to be um, identified and put on the boat. Everything had to be perfect. The team of people who helped do this were also a very, really interesting story. They were all volunteers. We actually put an ad in a yachting magazine asking for their help, asking for people to come and, and help. I didn't expect anyone to. They did. They flew themselves from around Australia and even the world to be there and to work seven days a week, day in, day out, on this boat. Mum cooked them dinner at the end of the day. That was it. And I kind of got to the point a couple of months in going, well, how am I ever going to thank these people enough for what they're doing? You know, this is just extraordinary. Uh, I felt quite guilty, I suppose. And luckily, somebody sat me down and told me that I was looking at maybe the wrong way, that maybe that I didn't have that much to offer them and I wasn't ever going to be able to thank them enough. But they were doing it not because they wanted to help, but also because they wanted to be part of the project. It was sort of a really basic and big lesson in leadership for me, that leadership's not necessarily about what you have to offer and how you're going to thank them, but about sharing a dream with them. And they were able to take ownership of the voyage as well. And it did. It became their voyage as much as it was mine as well. So we got all this work done. The most important job, or I like to think, we painted the boat pink. Um, high visibility, you know, cute girl power statement, I suppose. Bit of fun. Um, but um, obviously she was a tough little boat. And I love what that said. Here I am, this cute little pink boat, but I'm ready to take on the world. So I was ready to take on the world at this point. So the next thing I had to do was a little bit of sea trials. I headed out, and my first night out to sea, after all this work, with all this expectation, I just wanted to leave, I was getting excited, and I ran smack bang into the middle of a 63,000 tonne container ship, my first <laughs> night out to sea. This is not ideal. Um, when you're trying to tell the world, hey, I'm ready to sail around, do not go run into a container ship. It is not very confidence inspiring. It's embarrassing. Uh, there was a lot of damage to the boat, and I probably don't really have to tell you that it was also terrifying. It was horrific. The noise of the engines and the sounds as that boat collided with us um, haunted me for quite some time. But interestingly, I'm not going to say it's a good thing, but I look back and go, well, it really did happen for a reason. I mean, obviously, I learned a lot, don't hit ships. It's quite simple. <laughs> but I think we had the chance to improve the systems on board that should have told me there was a ship nearby. But most importantly of all, and this is going to sound strange, but I left more confident because of that incident. Now, just as the world was suddenly doubting me so much more, I was more confident. And that's because up until then, I'd done the training, I'd done the preparation, but I hadn't put myself in a situation where everything was literally falling to pieces around me. That's what happened that night, and I proved to myself that I could keep a cool, calm head, and I knew that I was ready to take on the world, uh, just as everyone didn't think so. The media criticism was intense, and it was very understandable, but it was very tough. I think the annoying thing about it was there was never any constructive criticism. You know, people were saying stuff that we'd already identified and possibly dealt with. To finally set off from Sydney, head across the Pacific Ocean, it was a big relief to leave. And the Pacific Ocean's a beautiful place to go sailing. So I did a little bit of fishing as I went. 210 days around the world, 23,000 nautical miles, one fish. <laughs> It did taste pretty good, so I suppose that's the important thing. Uh, I also took the opportunity after a couple of months at sea to climb up the mast, and that's these pictures here, and check all the equipment up there. It's also a pretty beautiful experience to get to the top of the mast there and see the boat sailing along below you. And I think for me, it went to show how much I'd changed since I was that little girl who was scared of everything, including heights, to get to the top of that mast and just want to keep going. On from there again, and I started heading south across the other side of the Pacific Ocean towards South America, and I hit my first storm of the trip. So this storm wasn't particularly bad, but it was the first one, so I was nervous about it. And the incredible thing about this storm was I had a dolphin swim along next to the boat for the entire six hours of that storm. It was just like he was sort of keeping me company, reassuring me. Every time I'd look out the porthole, there was a flash of a fin or a tail um, just there to reassure me. Maybe he wanted a bit of shelter as well. I don't know. Uh, Passed that way, I spent Christmas at Point Nemo. Point Nemo is the point furthest anywhere on Earth from land, and that's where I spent Christmas, this traditional family time. I was pretty homesick, as you'd expect, but not lonely. Lonely's for a Friday night, you're at home, nobody's asked you out. It's different when it's your choice to be out there, and it was. I told myself, look, there's plenty of Christmases to come. Um, this one's special in its own way. I rounded Cape Horn, so this is down at the bottom of South America, 
close to Antarctica. It's a cold, miserable place to be. Uh, without a lot of incident, sailed into the Atlantic Ocean. I was almost halfway around the world, and I hit a really horrible storm. I was expecting a storm. I got the forecast for it, but it got a lot worse than anyone was expecting. The conditions that night were worse than that of a Category 4 cyclone. Uh, really, really horrendous. We're talking 10 plus metre waves, taller than the roof here today. Um, it's not pleasant. And during that night, we had four what we call knockdowns. So a knockdown is when the boat is rolled upside down by a big wave. Now, if you can imagine, the boat is a mess. It's water everywhere. You've been rolled upside down a couple of times. It's pitch black. Uh, and it was a third of these waves that had me particularly worried because I could hear these things coming. And uh, this one in particular, the roaring noise of it approaching. You hear that, you know it's going to be bad. So I remember bracing myself and then walking up the walls and onto the roof as the wave turns us upside down and then chucked us into the trough of the next wave. It's not a gentle rollover and it's obviously terrifying. I can't honestly tell you what I was thinking exactly at that moment, but I have to say the moments and hours afterwards were really interesting and not something I talk about a lot because it is a little bit confronting and I genuinely didn't know what was going to happen. I couldn't quite believe that the boat was going to be in a state to continue, that it was going to survive this. How could it possibly survive the force of those waves? So I was sitting there contemplating that I might not make it through the night. My life raft at this point came loose from its lashings in the cockpit. I had to wrestle it down below, and with that um, life raft down below, I knew there was no chance that I was going to launch it if my boat did start breaking up. And it was a bit scary and a bit strange to look back and go, I went completely rational. And I remember thinking through different scenarios and coming to the conclusion that whatever happened, happened, uh, and that I was going to hang on, not because I wanted a hot shower, not because I was worried about myself or any pain, but because I didn't want to put my family through any more grief. I knew that it would have just been horrendous. And that's the thing that I clung to. That's the thing that motivated me, and I knew I was going to do anything to hang on because of that reason. Thankfully, it didn't come to that. Uh, the boat really did pull through. As you see here, there was a little bit of damage. The solar panel, some of the sails were torn, but really a testament again to that preparation uh, and how tough she was to get me through that storm. That's probably one of the worst moments out there, but there were a lot of fantastic ones as well. A lot of beautiful days. Dolphins jumping out of the water as far as the eye can see. One time when the water became so still, there was no wind, which is a little bit frustrating as you're not going anywhere, but it was so beautiful because that night it was so still that the stars were reflected perfectly in the water. I couldn't really tell where the sky stopped and the water began. It's incredibly beautiful. And maybe this is a little bit selfish, but there's something so special about having an experience like that completely to yourself. It's obviously lovely to share them as well, but I don't know, that was kind of special. So lots of good things about the voyage as well, but it turned out the last leg was pretty tough. That last leg coming under Australia, not because the weather was quite as severe, but because I had storm after storm after storm, and not having recovery time between them was really tough. One of the storms was particularly annoying as well, because during another one of those knockdowns, my bottle of dishwashing liquid came loose. And you can imagine when I came upright, there's dishwashing liquid running down the roof, the ceiling, the floor, bubbling up in my bunk. I'll never ever use lemon fresh dishwashing liquid again. The <laughs> smell of it just brings back memories. So to finally round Tasmania, and then this picture taken the day before I got home. Uh, as you see, it's quite a rough day but not particularly severe. And I love this picture because it really gives a bit of perspective. This is a rough day. It's not particularly severe. You can only imagine what it's like out there on those particularly bad nights. To get home was completely overwhelming. I had a lot of people there to meet me, which was really special. But to put it in perspective, I hadn't seen a person in the entire time away. That was nearly eight months. I hadn't seen land for months. I'd seen land three or four times in the distance the whole time. So to get back and to have colours, sounds, smells, all of these things I hadn't seen or felt for so long was really, really overwhelming, too much to take in. I kept staring at my little sister's face, or everyone's face. It was like I was experiencing and seeing them for the first time. Uh, and she found that a bit strange. She said, stop staring at me, you're making me uncomfortable. <laughs> Got through the harbour there, and incredibly, the Prime Minister was there to meet me, which was very lovely of him considering I was actually running a few hours late. And he gave this beautiful speech as I stepped off the boat about me being a hero. And then I was very cheeky and 
I stood up and said that I disagreed with him. The crowd decided to clap at that moment before I could finish my sentence. Um, and I did come across as very, very cheeky uh, before I could say that I disagreed with him because I didn't consider myself a hero. And that was something that was really important to get across because I was inspired by somebody who I realised, one of my heroes who I realised was ordinary, and I wanted to make sure everyone else realised that I was just an ordinary girl as well. It's been nearly five years since then, and so many special things have happened, whether it's actually travelling and stopping places, meeting people, uh, whether it's school, finishing school and studying now, whether it's my book, which I'm very, very proud of, competing in the Sydney Hobart Yacht Race with a youth team. We finished in second place, and a really amazing testament to the teamwork um, in that team. And I learned a lot through that experience, learning to sail faster. But probably the one thing that has been most special was, and very humbling, uh, my nomination for Young Australian of the Year. And I struggled with this award and this nomination because I'd been heaped with so many awards at this point. And I went, oh, there's so many other worthy people and so selfless, some of the other nominees. Maybe it should go to them. Uh, and luckily, somebody sat me down again and turned it around and made me realise that I was looking at this the wrong way, that I shouldn't be looking at it as another award. I should be looking at it as an opportunity to travel around the country, speak to loads of people and share my story. I did do that, and it was a really busy year. And the moment that stood out to me from that year was a girl I met, and she told me that she read my book, she'd been having a horrible time at school, she heard my story, read my book, and that inspired her to change schools and um, join the chess club. Such a simple thing. But that was so special and so lovely to hear, because that's what I wanted my voyage to show, that we do have the power to make our dreams come true. You know, there's so much inspiration out there. There's Instagram feeds full of it. There's inspirational quotes to, for miles. There's millions of them out there. And I think sometimes we forget inspiration's great, but sometimes it's more about making your dreams come true. Um, trust me on this one. Um, dreams are so, so much better when you're living them. So thank you very much. I'm going to finish up there. Thank you. Thank you.